We also love it when you participate. So if you have any topics that you're passionate about and would like to lead your own discussions, feel free to let us know and we'll contact Kimberly or Kelly and they're the ones that organize our events. Next week, we have a discussion about implicit bias and microaggressions with Dr. Pat Russell. But today, we have the pleasure of having Dr. J. McLean Briggs come in today to talk to us about the rising income gap and inequality in Seattle. So please join me in welcoming Dr. J. McLean Briggs. So I, my background is in public health, and my interest is global health, so I look at things through that lens of what is the health perspective here. So I'm going to try to create a context for you. So we'll talk about a little bit about what's happening nationally in inequality, and then why should we care? Like, what are the consequences of having a society that is unequal? Is it a problem that it's unequal? And then I'll kind of give you the context of where we sit globally compared to other countries in, in the rich world. And then we'll kind of zoom in to what's happening in King County and the environment to what's happening in Seattle. And hopefully all of that will be short and we'll have lots of time for discussion. Because I think this is a topic that affects all of us in our daily lives and is continuing to affect us um, more and more and more as we live in the Seattle area and go to school in Seattle and things like that. Okay, so since 1978, which was the most equal year for income in the United States, things have gone sadly awry and the gap has become quite large between those who have money and those who don't have money. So in 1978, um, the average worker, and we take the average male worker, you can read average female worker is roughly 80 cents on the dollar of that. Um, $48,000 a year, the, the typical one percenter, $393 a year. These images come from Robert Reichstorm, which if you haven't seen it, is really good, Inequality for All, um, and he's really amusing. So, here comes 2010 and what's happened. Your typical male worker in the United States, their income has actually dropped by quite a good bit. And your typical one percenter has topped the one million mark. So by 2010, that gap had literally widened very, very far um, from what it used to be. It used to be in the 70s that a CEO would make something like 60 times what their working people made. The people who worked, say, if you were talking about a, a store, the people who worked on the floor would earn about 1 60th of what the CEO would earn. Now it's 600 times what the CEO earns compared to what the person working on the floor earns. So when the gap rises like that, and in this case you just get a view of the fact that it's, it's risen across all the presidencies, but it started getting its really steep rise right at the beginning of the Reagan administration, came back down a little bit during Clinton, and then it took a, an extremely steep rise in the first Bush administration. So this is where we really took the biggest the biggest strike, if you like, against working people in the United States. During the time period leading up to 1978, we call this period the Great Prosperity because the economy was growing. People were able to move into a more affluent environment. This Great Prosperity excluded significant portions of our population. So African Americans were excluded. Um, immigrants, to a large extent, were excluded. Um, Hispanics were excluded. So as this great prosperity took hold, the issue of income inequality became inextricably tied with the issue of racism and um, discrimination in our culture. So even things like when the GIs came back from World War II, it was easy for GI, white GIs to get real estate loans to move out into the burbs and to get GI Bill to go back to school. It was much harder to do if you were an African American. So we began this tie during the Great Prosperity. But you can see that, 
here, income inequality is as low as you know nine percent of the, the of the the divide. So the top one percent of our um, earners had the lowest share of the income. So during that time in the 70s, when, when equality was greater, big earners had a less percent share of the total amount of money available. So people in, in less in the 99% had more of a share. And that in some degree was because there was a higher marginal tax rate. <coughs> so this is what Kashama so on would call taxing the rich, right? When the highest marginal rate goes up, so that if you earn tons of money, you pay tax. Right now, we're in a situation here in Washington, in Washington State, roughly, where they estimate that that of people who earn in the highest 20% um, earners, they pay around 5% of their income in tax, versus people who earn less, who pay around 15 or 20% of their income in tax. So the taxation rates have changed um, over time. Actual wages for working people have fallen pretty dramatically. So an average bank teller in 1978 could earn $27,000. Now they would earn 24. An average meat packer would earn 40, almost 41. Now they would earn 24. So actual wages have fallen. And you all know the cost of living has not fallen, right? Especially here in Seattle where it's escalated. So buying power for working people has fallen in a double whammy. Like further numbers have fallen and we don't have the buying power compared to the cost of living that we used to have. Also, higher education rates are falling off. And you see this dramatic steep climb in higher education rates during the time when we were moving towards greater equality up to the 24% in the 70s where roughly 24% of the population had bachelor's degrees. Bear in mind that these numbers aggregate. So if you were to separate this out and look at the African American community, what you would see is they did not have the same opportunity in higher ed. So you would see that their numbers would, would not be um, the same. And the white numbers would be higher. In that same time, we had um, higher union membership. So at the height of the union movement, or, you know, almost 40% of Americans who worked in the public and private sector were unionized. And there was good collective bargaining um, from those unions to be able to support working um, wages. So, and you see, as the middle class share of national income fell from the 70s through to the 2007, the, the unions also declined. Unions didn't just sort of disappear. There was active work to union bus. So beginning in the Reagan administration, there was active effort to dismantle unions to make it um, easier. And polarization increases. And you can see now we're in an area where our inequality levels are just off the scale and our political polarization is off the scale. People can't get along. Congress is stymied half the time. We have two candidates that are kind of far, which in a way is great. It's bringing us in line with you know, what we see in other rich countries, which is there is a bigger range of political opinion, but there's nothing in the middle here. There's no middle centrist position um, that people, uh, people go to. I, mean, I think you're all aware of this, so I won't harbor it. So this is our own homegrown Seattle Nick um, Hauner, who wrote an article in which he warned that people like him, who are billionaires, literally will will be looking at you know uh, violent action against them in, in the con like a French Revolution context. Um, and I think he's not far off. People get angry when they are excluded from being able to empower themselves. So that's kind of where we are in the US. So let's look at how do we compare to other rich countries. 
So in other rich countries, the inequality rates are only exceeded by Singapore um, uh, compared to Western European countries and Northern European countries. And you can see Japan and Sweden are both in the top four, and they do their equality um, work very differently. So in Sweden, you can earn a lot of money, you're just going to pay a lot of tax. The government will just tax that off the top. And if you can't make it on, you know, four million a year, then th that's too bad. The government's going to take it anyway. <laughs> if you are in Japan, the salaries are scaled so that you can't earn 12 million. You know, you, the, the salaries are scaled to a much narrower range. So either way you do it, you end up with less inequality. But you can see we're sitting right there, um, second to last. Our upward mobility has declined dramatically. So now we have, the, this is from Robert Wright, we have this situation where 42% of kids born in poverty will stay in poverty in their adult lives. Compare that to Denmark, which has 25%, and the UK, which is not, not a greatly equal society either, but only has 30%. So that's kind of depressing. We used to be the land of opportunity. Now, you, if you're born in poverty, you have more chance of getting out of it if you're in Western Europe or Northern Europe or even the United Kingdom, pretty shocking, than you do here. So health has a, 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 an impact from inequality. And if you look at life expectancy, which is on the y-axis, compared to national income per person, and you try to see a pattern, there really is no pattern. So you're looking just at how, what's the average number of years people live. So if you take, we took this room, we'd add up all the, the times of our deaths, we'd add those all together, divide by the number of people, and we'd get the average. That would be our life expectancy. So if you do that for different countries, you see that that compared to money really has no pattern. You can be, you can have quite good life expectancy without having tons of money. You can also have quite a bit of money without having very high life expectancy, like we do. Um, so there really isn't a correlation. But if you look at um, in, in, in inequality as a measure, so you look at the difference between the top 20% and the bottom 20%, and put that with life expectancy, it comes out to be statistically significant. So Japan is an outlier up there. So the, this information comes from a book called The Spirit Level, which is written by uh, two, British, um, uh, two British people, and they established something called the Equality Trust, which is an organization that processes this kind of information and advocates for a more equal, um, a more equal world. So I'm going to show you some health and social problems that happen in unequal countries. So they came up with an index that includes life expectancy, literacy, infant mortality, which is the number of kids who die by the age of one, rate of homicides, imprisonment, teenage births, trust, obesity, mental illnesses, and social mobility. And they put all those things together in an index and then they mapped it out against income inequality. And there we are at the top. And that's pretty true for, if you take each of these things separately, you can say, okay, what, what happens to trust? We trust less. So you go out and ask people, you know, do you trust people? You're gonna get a, much more likely to get a no answer here than you are if you ask somebody in the Netherlands or in Sweden. We have lower social mobility, I showed you that before, um, and that uh, correlates. We have higher infant death rates, if you look at them independently, um, than the more equal countries. We have lower child well-being, so child well-being is a measure not only of death, but school attendance, um, growth charts, the things that, that UNICEF measures go into making children healthier. So um, they look at things like Denver developmental scales that, you know, test whether your kids are, de are developing adequately. 
so lower child well-being. We have higher teen mothers, so of births between the ages of 15 and 19, we're kind of off the scale here. And, and there's lots of ideas why this might be the case, but clearly it's related to, to the state of inequality, that when young women in communities are disempowered, a way to get empowered really quickly is have a baby. Um, and so it, it, you, can, you can look at those in many contexts. We have more exposure of children to conflict. So this is something that UNICEF also looks at, is as a child's growing up, how exposed are they to violence inside the home, violence outside the home, conflict inside the home. And we score very highly there. We have more incarceration. You guys already know that. If you take the number of prisoners in the US and the number of prisoners in Russia, and you add them together, we constitute over 60% of the world's prisoners. So we have a huge incarceration rate, and we, for some reason, think it's a good use of our tax, taxpayers' money to take young men of color and incarcerate them. That seems a really bad idea to me. Like, we could do other things with that money. And we could definitely do other things to have those people have more um, useful and productive and fulfilling lives. We have higher homicide. We know that. We know that especially in Seattle, that our youth are at extreme risk of homicide in Seattle, and especially young men of color. We have lower math and reading scores. So this is not restricted to just those things you traditionally think of as health. It's, it, it encroaches into other things that are in the health realm, like, like reading scores and math scores. You see Portugal just hangs out next to us, have you noticed that? Like, as you go through there, there's always Portugal right next to us. Yeah. And then if you're not interested in health, and you're not interested in education or reading, and you're only interested in the environment, unequal countries recycle less. Than more uh, than than equal countries. Okay, so that's the same graph I showed you at the beginning, and it's an indication of why do we care? So why do, why do I care that we have such inequality? Bec and I see it every day working with students that that people are disadvantaged in our society by this extreme gap, and that the impact on them is all of these things, all of these social and health problems are exacerbated in our communities beyond where they need to be. And our response to them is to kind of band-aid each thing instead of saying, actually, we need to reduce the degree of inequality. It's not a case of like fixing this, fixing that um, all at once. I don't know if your sense of humor will stretch to this. If it doesn't, Please know I am not intending to be offensive at all. I just, uh, I think it's funny, so I thought you might. It's a little inequality report from the Wilkinson folks. Let's see if I can get it to play. How do I get to full, can I get to a fuller screen? Somehow, I don't know. Hello, and welcome to today's Inequality Report. High pressure fronts of inequality are sweeping over the United States, the UK, and Portugal, creating an increase in violence, drug dependence, obesity, teenage births, and premature death, here, here, and here. Meanwhile, Scandinavia and uh, Japan are uh, uh, experiencing a sustained jet stream of equality, causing thermal pockets of trust, social mobility, and better health to spring up throughout. Looking ahead to the next few years now, this prevailing wind of fairness will hopefully sustain itself right across the country, and indeed throughout the world, uh, dispersing the dark clouds of inequality and bringing in a brighter period of sustained well-being. Join us after the 10 o'clock news for another inequality update. That's all from me for now. A very good day to you. <laughs> I hope you think it's funny or not offensive. So let's focus our attention to what's happening in inequality in King County. So in King County, and the, 
data here comes from the King County Public Health um, Public Health Department, and they do quite a lot of work with this. So they have created a program called Healthy Communities that has some really good components to it. So they do a lot of analysis. So looking at the quintiles, so they're dividing the population into five groups, the lower, lowest earners, the next 20%, mm -hmm. uh, the next 20%, and then the 20% of highest earners, and looking at the mean household income. So you see in the lowest quintile, the mean is 15,000. This is taking all of the income of those households, adding it together, and dividing by the number of households. So there's a range here. The 15 is not, it's not an absolute number. It's, it represents a range. Nevertheless, it's quite a good way from 241,000, um, which is the mean household income for the top 20%. And if you take the top 20% and split off the top 5%, you see this. So the top 5% have a $420,000 a year mean income. So you know that's a range. You're taking what they earn all together, add it up, and divide. And, and that's a really significant difference. So if you have any doubt that we have serious income inequality, those numbers should be kind of like telling you, yes, this is for real. Oops, sorry, I think that's a funny slide put in there. So if you look at cities, so we're going to zoom to Seattle now. If you look at cities, you can see we're fourth in the top incomes um, in cities in the, in the United States. So we have, we have these very high earners. And part of the reason we have these very high earners, as you well know, is we have no state income tax. So we have no, no progressive taxation. Our taxation is amongst the most regressive in the country. So we pay sales tax, and we pay sales tax regardless of what you earn. So you have to pay, if you're buying a, a, a sweater, you have to pay sales tax on it. That's independent of earnings. In most places that are more equal, you have income tax, like we have federal income tax that's gradated by what you earn. So it, 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 people come here because there's no state income tax in part. So um, this professor, um, Manuel Pasto, who he's given a couple of talks in Seattle about income inequality and what's going on here and what we might do about it. Um, he says Seattle is America's income inequality problem on steroids. We're literally probably in the worst shape of most of the cities in the United States in terms of inequality. And what I just showed you is that means we're also in the worst shape in terms of social and health problems, that those two go together. So it's not just that we would like to have some of that money redistributed in a more equitable way. It's that we actually need to, to live a healthy and, um, and you know, better life for everybody. So he calls this the Colorado paradox, which means you look at our economy and its growth, it looks pretty good. But when you look at it in a little more depth, it's actually dysfunctional in the extreme. Because some people are earning a ton of money and driving, for example, you know on Capitol Hill, ranks are astronomical. You can hardly afford to live anywhere around here unless you have a good, um, a good high three-figure income. Because rents are going up and up and up. This, that's why you should support Kashama's push to get rent control in Seattle. We need rent control really badly because we have all these people who are earning tons of money who displace the people who actually live here so that they can't afford to live here anymore. Um, so our income is growing um, in median household income. So what does that mean? It means the median is the middle number. So 50% of the population earn more than that, and 50% earn less. So the median number for Seattle is um, increased around $5,000 in the one year between 2012 and 2013. That's a huge increase. That means there are a whole bunch of people 
who are coming in in the upper scales of income. And we know that, right? At least 15,000, 20,000 people are expected to move into the city to inhabit that new Amazon plus bubble. People move in, they come in with a higher income, they force the median income up. Now, only Oakland has outpaced us. And income inequality is on the rise. So we're looking at 19 times greater income amongst the wealthiest households than amongst the poorest. So I hope I've convinced you that this really is a very serious problem and it's not being made up by those of us who might be slightly more left-leaning than others. This is actually verifiable data that's, that's real and our, our attention to it is not only for the purpose of, of the fact that we don't, maybe don't think it's fair, but because it actually affects our community. So everyone in the community is going to have more problems unless we address this. So simply getting more policemen to stop homicides, more you know, testing scores to try and make kids do better in math and reading, more um, you know, interventions to try and make young women have less babies before they're 20. Those things are band-aids. Our real problem is our income inequality gap. And, and to be able to address that, um, we have to take action. So that's my sort of spew of facts, and I know it's super depressing. A global health student of mine once made the sarcastic comment at leaving the class saying, another completely depressing film in global <laughs> health. <laughs> So I apologize for the bad news. The good news is that we can change this. This is a social construct. This is not a biological necessity. We can do something about this. We are empowered to be politically active, to vote, to come out for people who stand for reducing inequality and creating a better world for all of us. So I want to give us a chance to discuss. And so I thought a way to approach this would be for people to tell either their own stories or their opinions about what's going on. Um, and we'll kind of start with like, what are the consequences for people? And then move to what, what can be done? Like, what do you think of as solutions for Seattle? Of course, for King County too. Yeah. So I don't want to start by telling the story about myself. I want to ask one more question. Um, this doesn't sound like it's an accident. It's a systemic right. uh, moving income from the people who take it up to one percent. Uh, right. So I'm curious. So who's doing it? How are they doing it? Okay. <laughs> I'll try. I think you could answer in five words. I'll try. In short sentence. Yeah. We'll so. My view of it is, no, it's not accidental. And I would say that it, we call this structural violence. So this way of structuring our society is actually set up to disadvantage some people and to advantage others. And I think the, the income issue is deeply tied with really profound issues around racism in our communities. So that's kind of the backbone to that. Who set this up and how is it run right so badly? So I think it was set up by, uh, by what you would call America's elite. Um, money families, money corporations, um, people who uh, traditionally held power. So we kind of know who that is mostly, right? Um, and then it got on a, a, a kind of roller coaster course when we started looking at corporations as having rights and corporations as having the ability to influence the political process. So the fact that, in my view, which is maybe left of it, is corporations are owning our government. Corporations influence government decisions more than we do. And we need to stop that because theoretically we're a democracy, right? We should be able to have input into our political decisions. So I think that's the real source of the evil, is that our politicians are essentially funded by corporate 
interests. And so they don't stand up against corporate interests, which is what they would need to do to start eroding that power. So I think it started as a very elitist thing, and now it's just gone crazy with the advent of corporations. And corporations, despite what everybody thinks, I think are malevolent. I don't think they are just benign. They're not neutral. They're malevolent. Their inner structure is created to create structural violence, to create more um, greed at the top and less. I mean, I think an example from the healthcare world I think is really interesting. If you work as a claims person in a health um, insurance company, so you're the person where people's claims come along, okay, I had to go to the hospital, blah, 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 will we pay it or will we not, right? And your job is to try and find a reason to not pay it. To go look in their history and see if you can show that, oh, this is a pre-existing condition, oh, this is something, um, and not pay it. So you do that and that's your job. If you succeed in not paying 20% of the claims that cross you, your desk, you get a large monetary bonus at the end of the year. So you're actually personally incentivized to decline people's claims when they've been for treatment and they were sick. So that's kind of, that's a structural violence to me. That person is put in opposition to the common good and not, not by accident, and it works. They do it. Do you want to give your answer? Um, no, I, I agree with, with you know, what you're saying. Um, I would just um, add another wrinkle yep. that those people at the top are creating such a vacuum and sucking up um, so much money from us that um, maybe 40, 50, 60 years ago, they were satisfied with taking that income from minorities and immigrants and, and poor communities, but we don't have enough money to, to yeah. you know, fill their thirst. So now they're sucking that money from the white middle class. Yeah. And um, so those people are becoming poor and getting mm -hmm. upset and deciding, you know, right. there's inequality and, and there's something wrong in uh, this country. So the, I guess the stereotypes that minorities have suffered from are now going to be visited upon the, the white middle class Absolutely. that's becoming now part of I us. think that's for real. And the reason we're hearing a lot about inequality now is because it's affecting white people. Right. Yeah. So, you guys are <laughs> us. so now people are going, whoa, this is not fair. So incarceration <laughs> rates among uh, young white men Starting to rise. <coughs> to rise, yes. And uh, education you know, of uh, middle class white people not being able to afford college and all those types of things that, right. that minorities have suffered for, you know, for eons and eons are now coming to the, to the middle class. I think, I think that's a real uh, accurate analysis. Let's hear from other people. What do you think about what's going on in Seattle? What do you think about it? What do you know about it? Yeah. Well, um, I live in a CD, and um, my, my father owns a home in a CD, and his brother lives right next door, and then my grandfather is like a block up. And I just remember as a child, he and, um, the neighborhood just, just from like basically being a child to like a teenager. And that between time, like all my neighbors were basically either bought out or they lost their homes or they were convinced in some type of swindle and they basically were moved out of the area. So um, now all my neighbors, it's just me, basically my family on um, that block. So um, my dad was basically um, stating, like I remember when, we, when I was a child, he was stating to his friends like the dynamics of Seattle are going to change and they're going to take over the CD and they're going to expand downtown. So if you guys don't hold on to your property, you're gonna end up losing it. And um, it's just, I guess really right now, I guess really what I'm trying to say is just like, um, I just read something on Facebook, like um, they're about to um, take over the Red Apple and Jackson and um, it was actually just bought out by a, a big company and they're gonna come in and bring in high rise apartments just like they did two blocks away from me on Union. Right. So it's like, um, 
I guess what I, I, I guess really what I want to know is what can I do right now to um, stop this? You know, um, I, I'm not really fully educated on what yeah. I can do, but I'm willing to do anything to try and stop basically what's going on right now. You know what I mean? Like the, they're taking away everything, you know? So it's kind of like, what can I do? I guess it's what I want to ask. So hey, do you want to answer? I kind of want to expand on what she said. Okay, go ahead. Because I mean, I grew up in the Central District and and I grew up in the 90s. And all that's happening now, I remember people were telling us it was going to happen. Yeah, right. People just told not to believe it. Right. But everything that happened, they already said it. They said exactly what areas was going to happen, what they're going to do and everything. And it just, people are now like, wow, it happened quicker than I thought. But right. we already knew this was going to happen. Right. I remember hearing about it and everything. And now, that's why I'm constantly kind of glad I got a second chance to go through education so I can live okay. here. But I knew this was going to happen. And I'm just like a, I'm trying to figure out what can I do right. to stop it from happening. And I think, you know, in the fight against power, the only thing we have in our favor is numbers. So the only thing we have is that there are lots of us. Yeah. And so it means becoming politically active. So starting to look at what are city council doing? What decisions are they making? When are they making the decisions to rezone this stuff? Can we get a group of people to go to that council meeting? Because government is public, it's our government. So if you can round up a group of friends and go to a city council meeting or contact a city councilor like Kashama and say, what can I do? Um, so that, so that we intervene into the process of government. Right. Okay. That's really our only hope. We don't, we, there's nothing we can do that will ma wave a magic wand, but if we get together, we can actually affect some change. I mean, we managed to elect Kashama to the city council and get the $15 wage, minimum wage, not as great as we would have liked, we would have liked it like right now, but at least we got it. And that comes from people like you guys getting on board with city government and saying, no, this is my city. I get to have a say about this. You, you can't just oust me because you have tons of money. Yeah. That's I mean, I'm happy to hear anybody else's suggestions. Yeah. Oh, I was going to add a good example of that uh, was with the King County Juvenile Detention Center how people went down to city, the city council meetings and basically like sat in at the city council meetings and um, so the city council passed a resolution that they would not support having that detention center in King I mean, in Seattle itself. That doesn't mean it won't happen, but um, that's an example of how people can get together in a group and like, influence city council just by being there, right? They don't know that you are going to exert your voice unless you exert it. Right? So they don't know that people out there are getting mad unless we let them know, you know, that, that we're getting mad. We've had enough of, of how it's going down. Anybody else have ideas? So two organizations that I'm actually personally affiliated with um, are Dockery Seattle. They have a website called DockerySeattle.org. And then the um, Tenants, Tenants Union of Washington are two organizations that are predominantly led, not green, really definitely, um, tenants who live not It's not dark so green like this, isn't it? G-O-T, G -O -T. Dark G -O -T. Green. These are organizations that are predominantly led by people of color um, who go in on issues such as this, especially like with the tenants union. Um, I have personally gone with the tenants union and testified in front of our city council and, you know, to stop these high rents and to stop displacing folks specifically of color from neighborhoods that are predominantly or, you know, um, for decades have been communities of color. So these are two organizations that I think that as folks of color, you should, you should try to get involved with. As Tell me possible. who these guys are. You have the Tenants Union, Tenants of Union, Washington. Okay. Yeah. And their offices are right in Columbia City. Both of them. They're like a couple of blocks apart. So, and you know, it's GodGreenSeattle.org if you just want to go on the website. But yeah, if you want to make a change, there are folks out there 
trying to make this change and testifying and like I said, I'm a person who's affected personally by these, these changes as well. I didn't grow up here in Seattle, um, but I came to the city thinking that I could have a, a better chance yeah. and was devastated at the fact that that is not true. Mm -hmm. So, especially as a person of color. So, these are two organizations that I encourage you to get involved with because we are out there every day, all the time, anytime any city council comes together about, um, you know, about these issues that affect us greatly, we're, we're always making sure that we are there. I mean, the idea here is, and it has worked for us in the past, the idea here is to create little pockets of political mobilization, right? that once they begin to link, and there's lots of them, it begins to occur something that's, that's in a position to change the power structure. Mm -hmm. you know? And I, I was born and grew up in South Africa. I was a part of the liberation struggle in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I was a child, the view was, we can't do this. This will be a bloodbath. There's no way we can do this. We have no power. They have all the money. They have all the power. They have all the guns. And it was pretty discouraging, but once we actually started working and we started getting leaders in place, you know, I became a team when Steve Biko um, it, it took on a leadership role in South Africa and really we were able to create these little mobilizations that started to link. The school kids started to mobilize, the ANC was mobilizing outside the country, the unions were mobilizing. So it's a question of getting us politically invigorated to participate so that we can have the voice of ordinary people in our government instead of just the voice of corporate structures in our government. Other folks, chime in. I have a question. Yeah. I mean, my parents stay in that apartment right now that's owned by a church, and I feel like the church owns other property for the reason they sold the property is because they're worried. I mean, the value is high, but they're worried for it to go high. Right. And should I be worried that my parents might have You to should move? lobby the church, for sure. Or, or was that something we could do, I could do? Right, that is something you can do. You can go to the church and lobby them and say, you know, I'm concerned about this. Are you, you know, what is your accountability to the people who live in these houses that you own? Are you going to participate in this big, um, you know, uh, essentially action against ordinary people by selling that property? And if they say, well, we need the money, you say, well, church doesn't cost. Other folks who can give us input. Yes, go ahead. Um, I kind of have a question for you. Um, so, I mean, it's becoming pretty clear that, you know, the idea of class and race is very intertwined. And so a lot of these times in these um, lower income neighborhoods, it is um, usually predominantly a certain race of any kind of, and usually minority. Right. Um, but at the same time, while we want to integrate all sorts of races, our problem right now with gentrification is when white, um, like upper class white people take over these neighborhoods, you know, such as like the CD or Capitol Hill, for example, because it's becoming more of like a popular neighborhood. Right. Um, what do you think can happen to integrate these races and these communities without forcing certain races out? Because we do, you don't want to continuously have these separated racial neighborhoods, right. but at the same time, like I said, when you have to speak out. The only thing you can do is speak out. And, and the bystander effect, we call it, which is people who are marginally affected or not affected, is really important. Those people speaking up and saying, no, it's not OK with me that you take over these people's community. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but in communities that have been gentrified by young professional white people, Sometimes they go so far as to set up a neighborhood block watch, right? Mm -hmm. To check out the people of color and what they're doing who actually lived there before they came. This is not uncommon. And they walk around the neighborhood kind of, you know, looking if there's trouble brewing. Which means what? Are there young men of color walking around? Yeah. 
And last thing, just to elaborate. So, um, in order to fix these kind of things, do you think that's more of like a um, we need to focus on also how like income affects different races, like different um, income gaps between races, or also with like renting or uh, what is it called when you can um, a rent control? Is that right. maybe also just a rent control problem? Right, all of the above, because we, what we, we have to do is get at the heart of structural violence. So we have to get at the heart of how we've set up our society and change it. And so we have to get government out of our politics, and we have to get the, uh, the uh, elements of racism that continue in institutions. So that, w because institutions often carry those pieces of, of Will this cultural, socioeconomic construct continue, or will we disassemble it? So, I mean, here at Seattle Central, I think we're quite lucky because we just got a new president who's pretty determined to work on these issues and has appointed a, a chief officer of diversity who's also determined to work on these issues. But it's really important not to have band-aids, to have really to look at what's actually happening and to speak up. You know, and, and everyone can speak up. It's not, it, it doesn't have to be that it's your house that's being bulldozed to speak up, right? You can speak up on behalf of and in solidarity with communities that are being affected. Yeah. Other people, quiet lot. Is it because it's too depressing? <laughs> <laughs> I think we also have to keep in mind that those one percenters, or whatever we to call them, are actively working to maintain their system. So when we're, oh, yes. when we're sitting quietly thinking about what should we do, they are definitely walking around in the halls of government, the halls of industry, in the communities, and are, are working to, to keep their structure going. We have a particularly noxious one in Washington called the Freedom Foundation. So before Christmas, these guys dressed up in Santa suits and went to people's houses who belonged to unions and said, give yourself a Christmas present. You know, get out of your union. You'll get the dues back. And we pre-printed a postcard. You can just sign it and throw it in the mailbox and you'll be out of your union and you won't have to worry about it and won't that be great. These people are stealing your money. This, they do this stuff. So you think, you know, really, really? But I think that's real. They are super actively seeking to undermine any response from ordinary working people in Seattle because they know that if we ever did manage to mobilize people, it would cause a big ruckus and some outcomes. Yes. I just had to watch a, a documentary for one of my classes called Democracy for All, and it's about um, the Seattle protests in 1999 against the WTO, the World Trade Organization, and tens of thousands of people like flew into Seattle and just shut it down for four days, and it prevented them from gathering. And it's just exactly what you're saying. If we can all come together to do this, like we can do so much. I mean, that was a super fun protest. <laughs> and if you look, you see all these fantastic, like, they were amazing art pieces and the crowds and stuff. But it was a great protest and did great work. But since then, we have the phenomenon of SPD on steroids, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So now if you go into protests, Especially if you're a young man of color, please take an old woman who's white like me with you on <laughs> protest because we can get in between you and the police and protect you. It's a, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it, it's a really good feeling thing to do. Yeah. But WTO went on its way. It was a temporary glitch. Right. Yeah. So you have to do more than just get out and street and protest and complain because after you go home they're still there working they're right. talking to your senator your representative your city council uh, they're 
having dinners and yeah. spreading money around to those people who make decisions. Yeah. And, and when you go home and you go to sleep, that whole structure continues to grow bigger and bigger and suck more money. From and they have more time to do it. They don't have to take the bus or buy their own groceries. Or, you know. So, it, yeah, I agree. Don't vote for people who are sold out to corporations. Vote, but it's don't vote for people. Way. It's hard, I know. It is almost ending. Yeah. So we're talking about strength in numbers, and this seems like a very common issue throughout America. I mean, I know that San Francisco is suffering the exact same situation, if not worse, and that's probably contributing to what's happening here, because right, people that make good money in San Francisco can't really afford to live in San Francisco, so move here. Right. And I did that because I did that. <laughs> so what about in the cities that are such in the same exact scenario? It's not like yeah. San Francisco wants to be judged. Yeah. And, and what we need is we need, you know, I, I'm saying this is a gross overgeneralization, so don't anybody be offended, but we need those who are good at social media to get, to start making those links, you know? Mm -hmm. Because that's the way that we're going to get linkage to happen, is by people who can do those links in a cost-effective way. So you don't need a lot of money to do social media. Uh, it is strange to think of San Francisco because uh, like, I know that San Francisco and New York City have rent control and they're some of the most expensive cities in the United States. So like, I always think to myself, like, bringing that to Seattle would have some type of uh, effect to the point where you know, like, people might discriminate against somebody. For, for example, you know, like, if you have an apartment that's 1,200 right. and then you have three applicants, one person works at Amazon, you have somebody who works at a bakery, and then somebody's on Section 8 or whatever. Right. And you know, the person can, in a sense, discriminate against right. you know, who they want to put in the house because of rent control. Right. right. So the only thing we can do is try to put into the rent control legislation provisions that try to lessen that, right? And grandfather in people who are already living in establishments. So that you can take an apartment someone's living in that costs $800 a month and then get someone to rent it for 2000 and oust that person. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying it's going to be an easy, an easy thing, but it beats the alternative, which is you can charge whatever the market will bear. But I think that if we build, if we say if we build more apartments, I, I don't say it's the best thing in the world, but we build more houses because people want to move to Seattle. Wouldn't right. that, in a sense, bring down the price if there's so much in living space? Um, I think the number of people coming in is too big for that to be an effective yeah. solution. So what we have to do, I mean, another solution people have talked about is every development should have mixed income housing. So every apartment or condo should have apartments that cost less or more, right? So it should be mixed. So you can't have these new condos that have massive, um, you know, that have masses of apartments, all of them cost a lot. Go for it. I just want to piggyback on what you're saying. I was living in the Netherlands for a couple of years, and they couldn't build any housing project without having a whole range of housing opportunities. So it didn't ghettoize poor people right. in one area, and you had a mixed community going to the public schools and using the facilities of the area. Right. I think it's a really good solution. We just need to get it in place because it's like we. Somebody else who's going to talk here, go for it. No, I was going to say, we don't actually build the towns and the apartments. The, the, they do the one percentage. Right. They, they own the, the property, they build it, and, and then they lobby not to have to include affordable housing, not right. to have to contribute to affordable housing costs. And that's where yeah. we can. Right. We can take action, we can lobby back. Right. Right? If we Say don't no. lobby, then they get their way. If, they, if we don't lobby, we'll be working out we whether they buy it or not. not, they do it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I agree. I think that's where our lobby position is can help. We, you know, if we lobby our city council to say these guys, we need to stop these guys from doing that, you know, and make sure we don't have people in positions in city government that are corrupt that are being bought out if possible you know more disclosure more transparency who are you getting your hawaii vacation from you know like that yeah uh, 
Um, I was just going to add on something to what the, what you said. Right. The, what you said in the front um, oh, was when you were saying about how um, if more housing was getting built, then the, make the prices go down. But I think the bigger problem with that is when Seattle is only so big, and so if you know, to, in order to build these apartment buildings, you're going to tear down houses which have families in them, and you're also talking about building apartments that are like one or two or three bedroom, which is not right. enough for an entire family. So that's right. like if you're forcing these families out of their homes and then they right. have to build, live in, in apartments instead of right. houses. And it's right. this constant problem. And, and not paying attention, I mean we haven't even gone there, but not paying attention to the green space, how much you, you know, parks you need, how much community centers you need, how much safe playgrounds you need. These things should be part of development, not separated from the yeah, Not everyone wants to be renters, just like she said. Yeah, I'm saying that a goal is we have the owners, you know? So, yeah. I mean, yeah. all this rent, 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 all these apartments going up, it's like, really? Like, this is the life? Like, that's what 80 percent of Seattle residents rent. Yeah. 80 percent. Yeah. I can imagine, because it's everywhere. Now. Thank you, everyone, for your wonderful contribution. <laughs>